like you can. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Perth, everyone. As Jessica already said, I'm Kirsten and I work for ICRA, as most people who are speaking to you today do. And as Jessica also said, we're the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. But before I jump into ICRA's projects and a bit more background over level overview of the SK stuff, I might kind of start at the beginning. Uh, because we do astronomy, but we don't do astronomy that produces the images you might have seen. Uh, we don't do optical astronomy, we do radio astronomy. And you're probably familiar with this diagram from school, the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm sure you're familiar with all these types of radiation, even if you're not familiar with the spectrum. So uh, those beautiful images you see from Hubble of galaxies and nebulae and things like that, they're all visible light. But things in space don't just emit visible light, they emit radio waves, microwaves, x-rays, all of these different things. So what we specialise in at ICRA is this whole section here. So we've got tiny, tiny, tiny section of the electromagnetic spectrum visible light. And then we have radio waves going from about one centimetre all the way up to kilometres in size. So we're dealing with a very big chunk of the spectrum of what is out there in space. And we need some specialised instruments to collect that radiation. Why do we bother doing astronomy in all of these different regions of the spectrum? Well, like I said, not just invisible light is emitted out there in space. This is the Milky Way. I'm sure you're familiar with this, it's our galaxy. This is a view across the sky. If you had really big eyes or sat there and could just collect light for a few hours, this is what you would see. But a lot of the light is blocked out by dust. There's a lot of dust between us and the centre of our galaxy, so that's the centre of the galaxy there. There's a big supermassive black hole in there. If we uh, shift down the spectrum a little bit and instead of collecting visible light, collect infrared light, we can see through that dust. We can see to the centre of our galaxy, we can see a lot of different things there. Then if we shift again into radio where we work in, you get a completely different view of what's going on. So with radio telescopes, we see gas. With optical telescopes, visible telescopes, we see stars and things like that. So what we're seeing here is the fuel for stars, hydrogen gas. And astronomers are very interested in hydrogen gas and what it's doing, where it is, how it's distributed and all things like that. So our specialised instruments that we use to collect these radio waves from space and learn about gas, like this one here, the Parkes Radio Telescope, quite an iconic telescope here in Australia. Um, you might have seen the movie The Dish that features this telescope. This one's um, almost 60 years old now and still going strong. Collects really great data about pulsars. So those are big uh, neutron stars, so stars made out of neutrons, that are spinning quite fast and emitting pulses of radio waves. And we can use them to try and detect gravity waves and understand the universe more. But unfortunately, uh, Engineering has kind of reached a limit of what it's cost effective to do in terms of building big telescopes like this. We want to have even more collecting area. As Jessica said, we want to have a square kilometre of collecting area, but you can't build a dish that has a square kilometre of collecting area and still have it be movable. Um, the biggest single movable dish on Earth is about 110 metres wide. The first time they built it, it actually fell down, squashed the building it's sitting on top of. So we, we have reached a limit of where it's affordable and easy to build telescopes. So astronomers got sneaky and uh, started building arrays instead. So multiple telescopes that they connect together using computing. And then these dishes all act as one telescope. So it's an array telescope. So that's what kind of the future of big telescopes is in radio astronomy. Because we're collecting a uh, a, an electrical signal. So we can actually amplify it and we can combine it and we can digitise it and, and do things like that. We don't need fancy CCDs like optical telescopes do. We have an electrical signal that we can work with and uh, all the astronomers that will be talking to you today will give you a bit more detail about the computing behind all of that. So ICRA, we are working in the field of radio astronomy. We also have astronomers that do optical astronomy as well, but our main focus is radio astronomy. And we were formed in 2009 as a joint venture between Curtin University and the University of Western Australia. So both the astronomy departments of both unis basically combined together and helped form ICRA and then we got some funding from the state government. And we just recently were refunded for another five years with $26 million. So we're a very well funded uh, research organisation funded by the state government of WA. So we have, we're one organisation, but we have the two research nodes at both Curtin and UWA. So you'll be hearing from both nodes today. 
And our, I guess the significant goal that we were launched with is to help prepare for and uh, deliver the Square Kilometre Array and its precursor telescopes. So the SK is an absolutely massive project. It's never been attempted before something of this size. It's going to be a leap forward of about 10,000 times better than our current telescopes. So it's, it's huge and I think you'll get a really good idea of how big this project is from both Andrew and Stephen when they're talking about their parts of it later. So ICRA is all about the people. Uh, in our four years of, of being around for almost five years, we've grown to 120 people, over 120 people, about 80 staff members and 40 graduate students. And we're the second largest uh, graduate student pool in astronomy in Australia. So we're training future astronomers as well as employing current astronomers. But it's not just astronomers that we employ. Um, so we have about 30% of our staff are astronomers and then we have a really big ICT team. And we also have a big engineering team and other people like me who do outreach and education. So um, it, we're kind of unique in that sense that we're an astronomy research group that has in-house engineering and ICT. And not many groups around the world do that. Um, sometimes it's quite separated. So we're very fortunate. Under the same roof, or two roofs, we have engineering, engineers and ICT experts working with the astronomers to basically solve the massive problems we're facing to make the SK a reality. So what are we actually doing? We have four, I guess, themes to our science. Uh, we've got this one called Galaxy Assembly and Evolution via H1. H1 is hydrogen. So we're looking at how galaxies have changed over time uh, from the very early days of the universe, 13 billion years ago up till today. We've got the variable universe. So things like pulsars, they change. Other things out there we call transient sources of radio waves. They flash on and off, they move around, things change. It's a new area of astronomy that we haven't necessarily been able to do at the level we can now with telescopes like the MWA, which Andrew will tell you more about. So this is a really exciting new area of astronomy. We also do a lot of data, in, data intensive research. I think the guys will give you an idea of just how much data these telescopes produce. And it's a big problem how we're going to store it, process it, do anything with it really. And so we have a major area, like a quarter of our science is based around how do we deal with the data these telescopes produce. And we also are looking at instrumentation at the MRO, another acronym for you, the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. That's where all the telescopes are up in Midwest WA. So we're looking at instrument, instrumentation there, so our engineers are actually designing and building things that go up there. And then to make those themes happen, I guess, we have four research programs. We have the science, the engineering, the ICT, and the MRO support, so support for the actual site where the telescopes are. So now a little bit of an introduction to the SKA. Jessica gave a really great overview there and I'm really, really glad that you made the point that it's not a square kilometre of area that the telescopes will be in. These telescopes will be spread over the entirety of Australia and much of southern Africa. So this is a very, very large instrument. But yes, the dishes will have about a square kilometre of collecting area. So there's two sites, southern Africa, eight countries. The core will be in South Africa, and then there's the site in Australia. So the core is in Western Australia, in the Midwest, about 850 k's northeast-ish of here. It takes about a oh, full day driving, nine hours to get there, and it's very, very hot, very, very flat, very, very empty, apart from the telescopes, as the guys will be able to tell you. The SKA, when it is fully constructed, will have three different antenna designs. So uh, perhaps a more familiar dish-shaped telescope. A lot of current radio telescopes look similar to this. They have a big reflecting area that we call the dish. And then they have this thing up here that receives the radio waves. The radio waves are bounced off the dish, received by the receiver or whatever equipment is up there, and then connects together to a massive supercomputer. We also have these ones here, which you can't really see very clearly in this picture, but I have heaps more pictures of these throughout my presentation. They kind of look like metal Christmas trees, and they're called the uh, low frequency sparse aperture arrays. So these aperture array telescopes are about this tall, and come out to about this wide at the base. And they're actually, um, the prototypes we have were manufactured by a closed line manufacturer, if that gives you an idea of just exactly what they look like. And then we'll have the dense aperture arrays as well. These are kind of a bit, up in the air about exactly what they'll look like and things like that. They won't actually be constructed until next decade at the very earliest, but they'll, they'll be the third antenna design. 
And then we have two construction phases for the SKA. You can't just snap your fingers and have five million telescope antennas built by next year. So we're going to do it in two phases. The first phase construction starts about 2017. It will take um, four or five years and we'll build 10% of the SKA. So that will be about 300 of these dishes and about maybe 300,000 of these uh, Christmas tree antennas. And then phase two will be the final 90% of the SK and that will start in the 2020s and take, well, they say they'll be done by 2025, but you know how these things go. So the part of the SK that will be in Australia is the SK low, so the low frequency aperture arrays, and also um, some dishes called SK survey. So there'll be three parts of the telescope built during phase one. There'll be dishes in Africa, some, a smaller amount of dishes, about 60 extra dishes in Australia called SK Survey, and then about 300,000 of the Christmas trees called SK Low Phase 1. So uh, these two parts of the telescope do very different things. SK Survey, given its name, is built to survey the sky. So it's going to have capability to look at broad regions of the sky at once and move very quickly through and create a survey of what's out there. We haven't actually done a sky survey in radio waves with this kind of sensitivity that the SK can provide before. So it's going to be lots of new information that will then determine what we can go and study afterwards with the full SK when we finally get around to finishing it. So that's SK survey and SK low phase one, as I said, will be about 300,000, 250,000 to 300,000 antennas. And then phase two will go out to about 5 million of these antennas. Um, and they will be spread um, throughout WA, predominantly in phase one, in little pockets are surrounding the core. This film here is kind of a simulation fly through from the core of the low frequency antennas to the core of SK survey. There's a still picture of it as well. It's a little bit less dizzying. So you've got thousands and thousands of these antennas here, car for scale, and then the dishes. The dishes are 15 metres wide in the reflector area. So not super huge by single telescope standards, but when you put 3,000 of them together in Africa, you end up with a very powerful telescope. So now onto something perhaps a little bit more interesting to the audience here, a computing background to it. So uh, obviously the computing infrastructure that we need for the SK is monumental. And it's actually not possible for us to have a complete SK in, with today's technology. We just can't do it. Um, we need a top 10 supercomputer just to run phase one of the SK, let alone the complete SK. So we're just, we need to wait for computing technology to catch up with us. And that's why there's heaps of people around the world working on this. But one thing that we've got right now is the Pawsey Centre, the Pawsey High Performance Supercomputing Centre, for SKA Science is its true long name, but it is doing other science as well, not just astronomy. And as I've said here, it's an $80 million supercomputer just down the road um, off Curtin University in Technology Park. Uh, it's a water-cooled supercomputer that actually dug down to the aquifer and it's all water-cooled. Um, it's managed and constructed by IVEC, which is kind of a, a conglomeration of UWA, Curtin, ECU and Murdoch, so the major universities in Perth and CSIRO. And 25% of the Pawsey Centre is dedicated to astronomy. So at the moment we have the MWA data archive at the Pawsey Centre and I'm sure that uh, Andrew can answer more questions about that for you and Kevin as well, I'm sure. Uh, and it's, I think, collecting about 400 megabytes a second still. Has it gone up, guys? Or is that still the data rate? So the MWA is actually operating at the moment. It's doing science. I'll tell you a bit more about it in a second. Um, and it's, it's streaming data through to the Pawsey Centre now, all the way on a uh, dedicated fibre from the Murchison to Geraldton, and then basically on NBN infrastructure from Geraldton down to Perth. So that's the Pawsey Centre. If you get a chance to go and have a squeeze at the building, I'd really recommend it, it's great. So what are we doing at the moment? Obviously, if we're not gonna start actually constructing things on the ground until 2017, what are we working on? So there are uh, this pre-construction phase for the SK, we're calling it at the moment, and that's to basically get ready, finish designs, finalise everything. And it has, I think, 11 or 12 work packages within it, and ICRA is involved in three of them. So we're helping design and verify the, the low frequency antennas, the aperture arrays. 
We're also helping design the science data processor. So this is the massive computing system that takes information from the correlator or the central signal processor, which Stephen is working on and he'll tell you more about, and basically make science-ready images for the astronomers to use. So both of these items are computing-based, very, very big challenges to solve in both of these work packages. And so we're part of an international team of people working on both of these, all three of these. So there are, I think, institutions from almost 20 countries involved in the SK pre-construction. And it's a massive, massive undertaking to get ready for this telescope. I'm gonna keep saying that because it's true and I need to hammer it home, it's a massive, massive project. There are also three precursor telescopes, as Jessica mentioned. She mentioned the names of ASCAP and MWA. So there's three precursors. One in Africa called Meerkat, and it's got dishes like this. It's going to have 60-something of these. I think they have five or six on the ground at the moment. There's ASCAP, or the Australian SK Pathfinder, which is in WA. It's got 36 dishes, and it's been constructed by CSIRO. And it also includes a technology up the top of the dishes called a phased array feed, which is kind of like a radio CCD in a way. And it's a new technology that hasn't been done before, and we're hoping that it will be used, if not just on SK survey, but also on all the SK dishes in Africa as well. And then, of course, there's the Murchison Wide Field Array. And this project is led from Curtin University. So a lot of the ICRA Curtin engineers and scientists and ICT people are working on this project. It was constructed by Curtin students, the dipoles themselves, and then the ICRA engineers, the Curtin engineers, have actually built all of the back end and things like that for it with their partners in India and the US. And it's the first precursor to the SK to actually be operating. So late last year, it actually started observing. So it's completely done. It's now doing science. Our astronomers around the world are applying for time on it and using it to study the universe. A few more pictures of ASCAP here. So these are some of the dishes. ASCAP has a spiral formation, so it has a core where there are about 15 of the 36 dishes. And then we have some spiral arms going out, so it's spread over quite a few kilometres. And the Murchison Wide Field Array is a similar configuration. It has core where lots of antennas are, and then it's spread out of about two to three kilometres overall. So the MWA, as you can see, it's very different to uh, the Meerkat and ASCAP. So it's a precursor to the low frequency SK, or those Christmas tree antennas, the ones that are going to be in Australia. So these things are about knee height and they look like metal spiders or turrets or, or whatever they look like. But there's um, over 2,000 of them set up in groups of 16 that we call tiles for convenience. And so in essence, each tile is, is treated as, as an antenna within the system. And so we have all of these tiles collecting signals from the sky. All of this telescope is computer controlled. There are no moving parts. So if we want to point to a different section of the sky, it's all computer run. So it's quite a computing intensive telescope this one compared to a dish where you can actually point it in the sky by moving it around. And here's a photo of the very first dipole that was constructed of the MWA. I threw that in here because it shows the students that actually constructed the, the dipoles. Um, so these are undergraduate students at Curtin University and as part of one of their summer programs we got to know them and then we asked them to come back over their winter break and actually build the telescope for us. So they had a great two weeks learning about what's going on with the telescope and a few of them went on to do their honours projects with data from this telescope. And then another still picture so you can see it a little bit better of SK low or the low frequency aperture arrays of the SK. So as I said these things are about seven foot tall and this wide at the bottom and they do very much look like Christmas trees in person. So that's the SK and Icarus projects. And now I'll move on to my area of specialty. So I'm our Outreach and Education Officer for ICRA, as Jessica said. And we're very fortunate at ICRA that our top level management takes outreach and education as a very serious responsibility. We're funded by the government, which means you're funding us, your taxpayers are funding us. So it's our responsibility to tell us, tell you what we're doing and make sure that people know what that money is being spent on. And so about 9% of the overall core budget for ICRA is spent doing outreach and education programs. So we have a wide range of things that we do. We have a lot of community events that we run. We run an event called AstroFest 
every year that about four and a half thousand people came to last year. Uh, this year it's in March 8th, so if you're in Perth on March 8th, we'd love to see you down at Curtin Uni. And we have about 50 telescopes out on an oval looking at the sky, both a radio telescope that was designed by our engineers at ICRA, so a little mini example one that is operated by one of our excellent astronomers who also wrote the software for it for me. Uh, and we also have a lot of optical telescopes as well showing off planets and things like that. And then we have a lot of stuff inside, so talks and, and things like that, to basically give everyone an idea, an idea of what's going on in WA at the moment. Because this is a major project, it's a real priority for the WA state government and from the, for the federal government. They were very involved in the bid to get the SK to come to Australia. And as you know, it did. So it's, it's a very, very, a project that has lots of high level support. So we want to make sure everyone knows about it. We also do a lot of things with schools. Uh, on the right here is a lecture theatre here at UWA filled with students from high schools coming to hear um, Andy Thomas, the astronaut, Australian astronaut, come and speak about his experiences in space. And we also do a lot of things like actually going out to schools and doing astronomy workshops and teaching them about the computing and engineering and electronics behind radio astronomy. So we take our example radio telescope out to schools and have students build it and look at it and, and use the software to measure the temperature of the sun. So a few of our highlights of the last few years of outreach and education at ICRA. It's AstroFest, of course. We do a lot of things for National Science Week. Andy Thomas, as I mentioned already. We also, while Andy Thomas was visiting, visiting did a live link up to the ISS and he was chatting to his wife on the ISS while he was in a lecture theatre with us. So that was a great event for kids to be at. We also do this thing called uh, Gorilla Astronomy, where we take telescopes out where people will be, so into the middle of the city of Perth or down where people go jogging on the foreshore of the river, and we kind of stop them from what they're doing, get them to come and have a look through our telescopes and have a look at the moon or Jupiter or whatever happens to be visible that night. And it's a really great experience because a lot of people that we grab haven't ever actually looked through a telescope before. They haven't had an experience of astronomy like that. So we have a lot of fun doing that. Now astronomers have a lot of fun talking about what they do every day. We also, um, led by uh, Stephen Tingay, who is the co-director of our Curtin node. He um, took some indigenous artists up to the SKA site quite a few years ago now and took them on a tour and, and showed them the instruments up there and explained the SKA and radio astronomy. And then from that, they produced an amazing art exhibition that has now toured pretty much the whole world. It's been to America, it's been to Africa, it's been to Europe, and some amazing indigenous artwork. Um, and so if you can remember Ilgarajiri and, and Google it, you can see some of that amazing artwork up there online. It's absolutely beautiful. And we also tour regional and remote Western Australia. So we make sure we go out to remote communities, indigenous communities, and all of the, the regional schools and, act and do activities out there. Because obviously, away from bright Perth lights, they have an amazing view of the sky. There's also a very strong connection in WA's indigenous culture to the sky. So we go out there and we learn from them and we tell them a little bit about, about, about what we know about the sky as well. And then of course, there's this great project called the Skynet, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute and try not to steal too much of Kevin's thunder because he'll tell you about the technical details behind it as well. And we have also an exhibition that we call Tuning In. So up on the right there, you can see our little mini radio telescope that we take around. We also have some optical telescopes and a little MWA dipole that we use to collect FM radio. Right. So the Skynet. The Skynet is my favourite project that we do. It's joint between the ICT team at ICRA and the Outreach and Education team. So it, we're producing real outcomes for our astronomers and we're also producing a lot of great education and outreach with it as well. So as Jessica said, it's a distributed com computer that we use to process astronomy data. It, there's, we've got almost 12,000 users have processed for us in the last two and a bit years. It's only two and a half years old now. And um, we have over 20,000 people signed up to the project. We've got two science projects that we do with it. One is called the Skynet POGS, which Kevin is going to go into great detail about, so I'll leave that to him. And the other one is called the Skynet Source Finder, and that's running an algorithm developed by CSIRO to find sources. Because obviously, if you have a lot of data of the sky, we don't have enough people to sit there and look through it and say, that's a radio galaxy, that's not. 
Uh, so they've developed an algorithm that does it automatically and it takes a while to process the terabytes and terabytes of data that we have sitting there waiting to be processed. Um, so we basically farm it out through an in-browser program called Nereus that we use, it's Java based. Um, and they send back results and say, I found sources in all of these locations, and then we can make a map of the sky showing where sources are. Now, POGS does a little bit different science. It looks at galaxies, and it also runs on the Boink, Boink architecture, as Jessica mentioned, but I'll leave all of that to Kevin to tell you about. But what I might do now is skip over to my web browser and actually show you the Skynet website and the outreach and education we have along with the Skynet. So. Let's ignore that for now, hey? Right. So this is the Skynet homepage. And if you come along to the skynet.org, this is what you'll see. And you can sign up here. As you can see at the moment, we're operating at about 48 teraflops of processing power. Uh, we peaked at almost 50, 57, was it, Kevin, um, uh, last year when some people decided to throw everything they had at us and, and just try and win a prize. Uh, and, but since then, we've been sitting steadily around 45 teraflops. So, I mean, that's, that's the equivalent of over the two years of quite a lot of money that ICRA hasn't had to spend on computing resources. Now, that's not to say that if we didn't have the Skynet, we would be able to spend that money on computing resources. Um, the work that the Skynet is doing is work that would otherwise take years and years and years or wouldn't be done at all. So it's actually a really valuable resource to our astronomers and astronomers from around the world. Kevin's working with astronomers at Johns Hopkins in the US with their data. Uh, so we're doing things that wouldn't get done otherwise with the Skynet. And so we're, we're really proud of the contribution that we can make with this. So once you've signed up to the Skynet and started processing using your computer, um, you can find out all about how much work your computer has done. So we have a credit system where we award credits for how much work your computer does. So basically, you are, so Jessica is pointing at Kim here. Kim is actually VK5FJ, and he's been sitting at the top of our ladders since what, like day three? No, no he's been, three months in. He's been winning since the beginning, basically. <laughs> Not just Kim's laptop doing processing for Kim. <laughs> so, as you see, we have leaderboards. We, we give people credits. Um, if you're processing on Source Finder, you get about one or two credits every 15 minutes um, on average. I'm not sure what's the average on, on Boink, Kevin. What, what's the average amount of credits you get? <laughs> just, We're gonna, you're going to lose soon, Kim. You better get more computers on there. Um, so we, ha we have people out there who go and every computer that they are allowed near, they'll install a Skynet on so they can get more credits because we also uh, give you trophies. As you earn credits, you earn trophies and they're just little little digital trophies, but we put some description in there. So that's our kind of sneaky science communication outreach there. Um, and the, the numbers are usually related to the trophy that you're getting. Um, these ones are a little bit boring, but there's some quite, whoa, let's get rid of that. There's some quite geeky ones along the way here. Um, so we have a lot of great fun making up new trophies. And if you have an idea for a trophy, if you're on the Skynet, please email me and I'll make it for you because we're always looking for new ideas. So we kind of have digital incentives like that to get people to keep processing for us. We have the leaderboards. We also offered a prize um, on our first year anniversary. We gave a all-inclusive trip out to actually see the SKA site and see the Murchison Widefield Array and ASCAF out there in WA. And Kim, of course, won that prize, <laughs> which is why he's wearing an MWA shirt right now. So he got to come and spend um, three days with us out driving up to the site and spend a day up there. So you can harangue him for details of what the site's actually like from someone who isn't paid to say good things about it. So we have yeah, the dashboard with all the stats. My rank is not very high at the moment, but I'm getting up there, almost a million credits. Tells you all about the latest trophies you've earned. You can join alliances. So I'm, of course, in the ICRA alliance, but we're not doing so well. We're like 12th or something like that. And then you've got your contribution to both projects. So most of my contributing has been to the Skynet POGs, and that's because when you contribute to the Skynet POGs, 
you get to see the galaxies that you've helped process. And I think this is the best aspect of the Skynet, that this is, this is science data that isn't publicly available. You can only see it if you're in the Skynet. And I'll click on this one here, I, on M100, which is a really beautiful galaxy. You actually get to see the results. So this is a result from the Skynet processing that shows how fast stars are forming in this galaxy. So the bright spots are periods of lots of lots of new stars, and then the darker spots, not so many new stars forming. And so this, this here is, is a direct result that's uploaded to the website for me to see because I helped process this galaxy. And so we can go back and see that I've actually helped process many, many galaxies. It goes on for a very long time. Um, so you, you end up with a big atlas of all these galaxies that you've helped process. And then we also have a plugin for Stellarium, which is the open source free planetarium software uh, that lets you map where your galaxies are in the sky. So it gives you a real world idea of how you're contributing to our work. So Kevin will go into more detail about the science behind the Skynet pogs and how he's doing all of that in his talk. So I think that's it about the Skynet. In fact, I think that's it for my talk. Shall we go back to Keynote? Yes, there we go. So that's ICRA in a nutshell. That's the SK in a nutshell. It's hard to go through um, the complexity of a project like the SK in just 35 minutes. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So are Kevin and Andrew and Stephen. They'll be more than happy. In fact, they'll probably be able to answer them way better than me because I'll have all of the technical information. Uh, but otherwise, is there any questions right now before I finish up in two minutes? No. Excellent. Well, I hope to see you all processing on the Skynet for us. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of computing resources at your disposal that you can help us out with. Uh, and so I hope to see you taking over Kim on the leaderboards in a few short years. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.